pleased to be joined by Zach McKinnell, the host of the Blue Bloods podcast. How's it going, Zach? Uh, not bad, man. Just uh, pre- definitely appreciate you having me, man. Always, always down to talk college football in no better time, given that the season starts next week. And thankfully this year we can have fans for the most part, or most teams can have fans. So um, before we start talking about college football and stuff like that, if you want to mention um, your, more about your podcast and all that so that people know more about, you know, how you do it and stuff like that. Absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, uh, the Blue Blood CFB podcast, the Blue Bloods podcast, whatever you want to call us, man. You can find us on YouTube, any and all podcast streaming platforms. And we just strive to be your one-stop shop for all things college football. We're probably the only show in the country that does FCS, HBCU, Power 5, Group of 5. Like, if, if, if you've got a favorite team, no matter who it is, we've probably talked about it, had a player from that team, everything. We do player interviews throughout the all season. We bring in experts from teams in the all season, and uh, we, we drop probably – we drop daily content on YouTube and sometimes even two, three videos a day. So if you're a college football fan, man, make sure to find us wherever you listen to podcasts and or YouTube, and we'll be your one-stop shop for college football. All right. Sounds great. Again, all that will be in the link down below. Um, And of course, your pod and all that. So um, and, you know, college football season is really close, but there's a um, well, the big kind of big news right now, just in football in general, is Tim Tebow just got cut. I know people consider one of the greatest college quarterback or college football players of all time. But Tim Tebow is officially most likely done in the NFL. Do you think or first of all, what did you think of that? Um, What did you think that Tim Tebow was cut? What did you think of that exactly? Um, I mean, for me, you know, being a college football guy, the Tim Tebow that, you know, we covered, grew up watching at Florida was not the Tim Tebow that you saw on the field um, down there in Jacksonville. What it was pretty much, in my opinion, was Urban Meyer felt like he owed him at least a shot, owed him at least a practice squad shot. And, you know, he got that. And for me, I never thought he was going to make the roster. I never thought he was going to start for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, to pick up a whole new position that you've never played in your mid-30s and expect to be a top-30 player at that position, which is what it will require to be a starter in the NFL, is just not realistic. And then when all the videos came out of him at, at during the preseason game, whiffing on blocks, getting thrown around by guys who would – who probably aren't even going to make the roster. His fate was kind of sealed. And I feel like the reason the cut happened when it did is because every single news outlet, sports outlet was talking about that clip. And if Urban Meyer gave him a spot, he would lose all credibility in the locker room. So I feel like what it did is it achieved both their goals. Tim Tebow got one more shot at the NFL. Urban helped out a friend. And and the end of the day, man, no harm, no foul. It happened, and now he gets to go be happy on SEC Network. But I don't think anybody realistically expected him to make the roster, especially as a tight end. Yeah, I totally agree with you because I let's like if Tim Tebow maybe would have tried tight end about ten years ago or back in 2013 yeah. when he was in New England, he probably would have got a shot. And mm-hmm. but it just it's different now, and um, it just it didn't seem like it was ever going to fit. And I was kind of surprised that he tried again. It seemed like he had some success in baseball. I know he had some injuries and I know he kind of was stuck in AAA. It seemed like, but I thought he should have stayed with baseball a few more years. You know, he maybe he could have a chance to actually play for the Mets, like the, the MLB or like the, they're actually yeah. the team. But unfortunately that didn't work out for him. And he wanted to try football. Most likely he's going to go back to um, broadcasting the SEC network, but it's a little disappointing, but I think at the same time, Urban Meyer really had no choice. He gave him the shot, and basically it was kind of a win-win for all like parties and stuff like that. So do you think, or actually before we go back, or before we start with the college football season, do you think Tim Tebow will go back to broadcasting? Uh, he should. I mean, he had a great gig on SEC Nation, which is like the college game day of the SEC Network. You get to travel around to all the top SEC games. You've got a lot of SEC cred, a lot of SEC fans. So for me, you know, if you want a long-term career in sports, that's your option because you're not going to make the MLB now. You're not going to make the NFL. I mean, so I feel like your playing sports career is done. You know, he doesn't need the money, but why not go talk about and broadcast the sport you love for ESPN? So I would imagine you're probably going to see him on SEC Nation starting up in two weeks, wherever they pick week one to go for the SEC. 
Yeah, and I think he was doing a pretty good. I don't remember exactly. I think it's been a while. Well, I guess it's been what? I don't know, how, 2019 the last time he was doing it, or was he doing it last year? I can't remember. Yeah. But um, I think he I think he was balancing both last year because okay. I believe it was Paul Feinbaum, Laura Rutledge, um, I'm, I'm blanking Tim Tebow, and then um, I'm, I'm blanking on the guy from ESPN who did it with them, uh, Marcus Spears okay. from LSU. The, they were yeah. the four, and that they all did a great job, and it's a great dynamic, and I thought it was a great show. So for me his best career path will be doing that, but you know, he's going to be successful in whatever he's doing. He doesn't need the money. He's not struggling. So I'm sure he's just going to make whatever decision is best for him. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, that would be ESPN would definitely, op- um, would definitely welcome him with open arms because they could definitely make a lot of money. And I remember back in the day, they used to always talk about him. So I think they'll definitely be excited to have him return. Um, so now let's go on to the college football landscape. Um, the big news this week, of course, in college football was the ACC, Big Ten, and Pac-12 have thought about possibly merging or having some type of alliance. Do you think that will happen? And when do you? And if it does happen, when do you think the the when do you think they should merge? Like, what exact year would make the most sense? Um, so, I mean, the thing with the merger is one, I think it's going, I think it is going to happen. I think today they announced that it's almost official as it can be. And two, you know, there really doesn't have to be a start date because what the merger is, is not, they're not merging the conferences in terms of they're all going to be one conference. And I think that's where a lot of people are getting caught up is Clemson's not going to be part of the, you know, what, whatever it would be like the pack 40 teams or whatever it may end up being what the Alliance really is. It's a scheduling Alliance and a voting Alliance. So what that means is pack 12 teams will be able to freely schedule ACC teams, vice versa, and then also throw in the big 10 schedule. So what it's going to do is they're almost combining their forces to raise the strength of schedule raise the perception of the conferences that way those conferences can be more competitive for the college football playoff which has been a problem in the past especially for the pac-12 and especially for the acc outside of clemson because once you get past clemson the average college football fan doesn't respect that conference as a as as a entity so what it is is a scheduling alliance to allow them to play each other out in in non-conference games that way they can increase their strength of schedule. And the voting alliance is important because according to all reports, a lot of people viewed and a lot of people high up in the ACC, Big Ten, and also the ACC viewed the SEC and what they did with Texas and Oklahoma and acquiring them for their conference. They viewed it as aggressive and they viewed it as the SEC trying to monopolize college football especially when afterwards you had a lot of reports about the SEC trying to grab Clemson and Florida State as well. So what the ACC, Big Ten, and Pac-12 don't want is the SEC to become the new NCAA because if they get all the best teams, then what's the point of having a playoff and what's the point of having college football as we know it? So what the commissioners did are come together to almost – this alliance should be called the anti-SEC alliance because the reason they're an alliance – is because they're trying to outvote the SEC on big issues. They're trying to stick together against the SEC because they feel like it's being too powerful and that the SEC is trying to monopolize college football. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, with when Texas and Oklahoma made the announcement that they were going to the SEC, it was like everybody started panicking. And it seems like the Big 12 is kind of left for dead here because they weren't part of the ACC and Big 10. And as a Louisville fan, and I live in Iowa, which is crazy to be that type of fan, but I can actually see us maybe playing Iowa once a year, whatever, however they do it. And I can actually not have to go to Louisville to watch the game, which would be awesome. But again, it's very interesting to see what happens. And that would be fun to watch Clemson and Ohio State every year, or however they do it. And in basketball, you got teams like said in the ACC with North Carolina and Duke and, of course, the Big Ten, you got in the ACC, you also have Louisville, and then of course in you know in uh, in football, you have Clemson, Ohio State, um, and Michigan, and it, it's going to be fun. Um, or do you have anything else to add to that? Oh, 
Yeah, and so, you know, I've been vocal on our podcast about the non-conference problem in college football mm-hmm. and the uniformity and conference scheduling. What I would like to see with this alliance, one of the positive thing I would like to see at least is – these conferences form some sort of, you know, in basketball, you see the SEC Big 12 Challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, Joel Klatt also uh, was, what the, I guess, the first one that I've heard propose this is where the ACC and Big 10, let's say they make up like a challenge to you know, open up week one, two, and three. And you can spread the games across the first three weeks where the two champions face off in the primetime matchup. Then the second place from each conference face each other. It's the third place uh finishers face each other and so on and so forth that way you have one even matchups and two it 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 exhibits the best of the best that you have and what that will do is allow the conversation to begin to to be had about what what these real strength of strengths of conferences are because you know you know you saw alabama play duke week one a few years ago what does that prove about either one of those teams i don't think anyone in the country thought duke was ever going to actually beat alabama and the real matchups you want to see are the Auburns versus Washingtons that we saw, which was a classic game. The Auburns versus Oregons that you saw, which was a classic game. You, you see those huge games. The Georgia Clemson, the Georgia Clemson matchup this year is huge. You don't want to see Alabama go play the ninth best <laughs> ACC team. You don't want to see LSU go play the tenth best. Big 12 team. You want to see the best of the best play early in the season. And that's what I hope to really see coming out of this alliance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, with the basketball, you know, the ACC plays the Big 10. I think it's the SEC versus Big 12. And yeah, if you had something that with football, that would make a lot of sense. And that's actually, I didn't hear anything, but I didn't hear, um, or I didn't know about that with Joel Clapp, but that's actually a smart decision because then would get Clemson, Ohio State. That'd be a great matchup. And that would be fun to watch, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited for that. That would be very exciting to watch, and it'd probably be what on ESPN or ABC or however they do yeah. it. But um, so now let's start. Let's go back to the season. It seems like Alabama once again is going to be a favorite. I think Oklahoma, the preseason ranking was ranked what second or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you see the season going? And is there any chance that anybody can actually chase Alabama? Um, so my, so I, I guess we haven't made our official national championship picks on our page, but I'll just give y'all my pick anyway. I think this year, man, if there's ever a year that Lincoln Riley is going to win a national championship at Oklahoma, it's going to be this year. Mm-hmm. That, that team, man, is loaded. We did an episode. I think I actually uh, released it this week where I break down like why Oklahoma should be the preseason favorite like if you're ranking just based on this year Oklahoma has the best roster on paper in my opinion they have Spencer Rattler who is probably the best quarterback in the country you can argue second if you love Sam Howell I'm not going to hate you if you argue argue Sam Howell but when you look at the opening here because when you know if you're a college football you know you research and know about college football when's the last time that what three of the top four teams were replacing quarterbacks and had first year starters you have Bryce Young in Alabama now given he's a five star arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the country already and if he lives up to the hype no worry for Alabama then you have Clemson bringing in DJ, who is a first-time starter. Let's be realistic. Two games does not make you an incumbent starter. So we're going to see how he can lead Clemson throughout the year. And then you still have a quarterback battle raging, even though the favorite looks to be um, Stroud, CJ Stroud at Ohio State. You have Quinn Ewers. You have Jack Miller. You have C.J. Stroud. You have like a four-person quarterback battle raging in Ohio State. And then you have Georgia, who's returning J.T. Daniels. But we just heard this week that they're losing like three wide receivers and their top DB to injury for week one against Clemson. So what are they going to be with the injury bug? All these contenders have huge question marks. And when you look at Oklahoma, they have the returning quarterback. They're all Big 12 running backs coming back. The offensive line's all coming back. Their wide receiving units all coming back. All the defense is coming back. The only question I have about Oklahoma is their secondary, which I feel like is not a huge question because they have a lot of talent on the back end of that defense. But what you're going to get with Spencer Rattler is Marvin Mims was a breakout player for me last year. Austin Stoner at tight end comes back. He was the highest graded tight end in the country before he went down with injury. 
Kennedy Brooks is back at running back, and they landed an impact player in Eric Gray from Tennessee who transferred after all the turmoil that happened under Jeremy Pruitt with the Vols. And on the defensive side of the ball, a name that you're going to have to remember is Nick Benito. He's an edge rusher out of Oklahoma and had the highest pass rush win rate, had the most pressures, and it might be the number one defensive lineman drafted next year out of out of college, you know, right there with um right out there with Cape Kayvon Thibodeau out of Oregon. So right now, Oklahoma for me is looking like a really, really strong team. And I'll also if Georgia can stay healthy, I really like what they have coming back. They were a different team after JT Daniels took over last year where they won out at the end of the season. JT Daniels threw 10 touchdowns and two interceptions in only four games. And Kirby Smart has made some questionable QB choices. JT Daniels would be the best quarterback to start a game for Kirby Smart since he's been at Georgia. So I think this year, Oklahoma and Georgia are two teams you need to watch out for. And if Bryce Young lives up to the hype, of course Alabama is going to be in it. But for me right now, those are my three top teams in college football right this second. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize how good Oklahoma was until you kind of did that or explained it because I haven't really looked at Oklahoma really this year yet. And, yeah, with that type of roster, and, of course, Spencer Radler is the more popular guy. And, of course, him and Sam Howell are probably the two best quarterbacks in college football. So I could see why I could see a case that Oklahoma could be a really good team. Georgia, um, what about? And the ACC seems similar to the SEC, where it's most probably good. Alabama's going to be the favorite, and it seems like Clemson's going to be the team favorite. But who probably would be the second best team in the ACC? Would North Carolina be that team, or is it someone else? Uh, pers- personally, I think it's North Carolina. You know, you can make an argument for Miami. But there's a lot of questions about De'Aaron King's injury history and consistency. He's been banged up. He got tore his ACL in the bowl game last year. And the whole storyline, like the career arc of De'Aaron King has been plays out of his mind against lesser to like mid-level mediocre talent. And then when he plays the best of the best, he just can't seem to live up. And we saw it last year against Clemson where Miami was running through the ACC and then they averaged like three yards a pass and like negative ru- yards rushing against Clemson and Death Valley. So you can't have that if you're really, you're realistically going to challenge Clemson for the ACC. I like North Carolina because last year they were a really good team and they got hot late in the year. I mean, when you look at that, I think it was a 62 to 20 domination over Miami and they ran for 500 yards in Miami gardens in the last game of the year that left a real strong impression for me. And then you you got Sam Howlett quarterback, man. He's unanimously a top two quarterback. Some people have him number one and as the Heisman favorite, but the question for me is going to be weapons for UNC. And if that's really going to determine if they can challenge Clemson, they lose Javante Williams and Michael Carter to the NFL draft, both top, you know, both drafted in the top three rounds. Then they lose their top two wide receivers in Deami Brown and Daz Newsom to the NFL draft. So what is that What is that running back room and wide receiver room going to look like? And I think there's some good options, but for me, I'm all about what you do on the field. Everything can look good on paper, and if you don't put it together on Saturdays, it really doesn't matter how great you look all written down. We can talk storylines and notes all day, but... Until Josh Downs, uh, Caffrey Brown, all those guys step on the field, we really don't know what they're going to bring. But the strength of this UNC team, which is weird for a Mac, uh, you know, a Mac Brown team, is going to be the defense. Jay Bay- Quick shot to our sponsor of today's video, and that sponsor is our good friends over at HelpYouFind.me. You're probably asking yourself, JJ, what does Help You Find dot me? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Peter Sanchez, the founder, creator, and owner, was originally worried about his daughter and his mom always asking him for his travel details. Help You Find dot me was initially created for collective peace of mind. 48 hours. These are the most crucial, our most critical moments to find you in the event of an emergency or worse waiting for the legal process to access your important history information which can take up to weeks upon weeks upon weeks with help you find dot me you have your own secure and encrypted digital if i go missing file that can give you your most trusted people access to virtual information much sooner than the authorities 
Each person you share with that has your has its own access rules and everything is completely encrypted. Not even help you find .me can access it. This puts you in total control of your data. You can also update your location, submit photos, screenshots, and post random information or notes on the go. It's as easy as texting with a friend. To find out more information, go to helpyoufind.me. Also, don't forget to use the promo code down below in my description. If you use the promo code STP2021 to get 15% off your first order. Again, that promo code is STP2021 to get 15% off your first order. And go to, uh, if you want more information, go to helpyoufind.me. And again, I'll put the link down in the description down below. All right, let's get back to the show. Man, who's the defensive coordinator, has done an outstanding job building this roster. I think UNC might have the strongest corner pair in the entire country. Tony Grimes and Storm Duck have uh, have just out unlimited potential. Tony Grimes is a kid. I don't know if you know this or you know or your listeners do. This kid reclassified right before last season, skipped his high school year, came onto the field and earned a starting job by the end of the year at 17 years old. Unbelievable. That's how that's the type of potential Tony Grimes has as a five star and he, he's long, explosive, he's so fast. He got clocked on a, I believe, a punt return his last year in high school, accelerating in full pads, in grass, all in a real game, accelerating to 20 miles per hour in under four seconds. That's the type of acceleration and speed Tony Grimes brings you. Storm Duck's a two-year starter. This is really going to be his breakout year, so I really like what UNC is returning. And if there's any team in the ACC that, can, that for me, can, can compete with Clemson, Clemson is going to be UNC this year. Yeah, it's like I say, especially when you have one of the best quarterbacks in the league or in the country with Sam Howell. But yeah, I was like, I was kind of thinking as the ACC the last five, six years has been dominated by Clemson. Before that, it was dominated by Florida State. But it seems like there really hasn't been that. It's number two is he's always really distant. So it would be interesting to see if North Carolina can actually compete with Clemson. But we'll see. I mean, it's definitely going to be a competitive and fun season, I think. Um, on the Big Ten side of things, again, Ohio State is probably going to be the favorite. But who would you say, or really, do you think Ohio State should be the favorite in the Big Ten? Yeah, by, by like leaps and bounds. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you look at the other teams, there's a lot. There's a there's a handful of teams I think can compete. But when you look at the roster that Ohio State and uh, Ryan Day has put together, you, you just can't touch it. I mean, when you look at the wide receiving unit where Ohio State, realistically, so everyone likes to talk about depth and how deep this team is. They probably have a wide receiving room where seven guys can start at any other school in the country right now. That's, I mean, when Marvin Harrison's son, who was one of the highest rated wide receivers coming out of the country, is might be your lowest wide receiver on the depth chart. That shows you the type of depth that you have at Ohio State. And then Chris Olave is probably the best receiver in the country. He remi- he He's going to be like that new Jamar Chase that's going to go in the top five. He led the country in separation on, on targets last year deep down the field. Whoever's the quarterback is going to have an easy job. This O-line, man. It, 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 you're going to turn on an Ohio State game this year, and you're gonna it's going to be watching like a quarterback playing behind like pine trees, man. They're gonna, it's just going to be a bunch of huge guys where you're like, man, where do they find these kids? The one question I have about Ohio State is their secondary, though. Their secondary is going to be young. Their secondary is going to be unproven. And the secondary really cost them last year against Alabama in the national championship. So for me – I think the defensive line is going to have to carry them. Zach Harrison, Ty, uh, Tyreek Smith are going to have to be huge edge rushers. Haskell Garrett on the inside of that nose defensive tackle spot are, is going to be big. And then they have five-star Jack Sawyer, who had like three sacks in, in the spring game, who looks every bit the part, was a top five player in this past class. So they have the defensive linemen. Can the defensive line do enough early to let that secondary gel is really my question. And when you're looking at who could come out of the other division, you know, I'll look at a team like Wisconsin. But the problem is, you know, there's so many questions. Like, you know, you don't know what the quarterback play is going to be. Graham Mertz is so talented, man. But he he played electric against Michigan and Illinois. I mean, he had one incompletion against Illinois, you know, lit it up against Michigan. 
but then he goes out against Northwestern and throws for like 90 yards and it costs them the game and it costs them a chance. And Northwestern has been a crux for Wisconsin in the recent years. And that's why Northwestern has represented that division two out of the three last years in the big 10 shocking everybody. The questions I have are the run game for them, which is weird coming from a Wisconsin program. You look at the history of running backs. They have Jalen Berger, who is supposed to be the next man up uh, last year, but they really didn't utilize him appropriately. But I think this year he could be a breakout player. The O-line is always going to be outstanding, man. And then the other thing is depth at the wide receiver spot. They really don't have any wide receiving targets that stick out for me. Ever since they lost Quintez Cephas to the NFL draft, they've kind of been looking for that next wide receiver to step up. I mean, Jake Ferguson at tight end is one of the best tight ends in the country. I get that. But you're going to have to have a wide receiver that can get deep, that can make plays down the field. Danny Davis III is a promising young prospect on Wisconsin. But outside of him, there's nobody I point to and say, man, we are, we're in third down and 10. I can throw it to that guy and he can make a play, which could be a problem when you're going up against Ohio State. And they have 10 of those guys that you can trust to go make a play on third and 10. So that's what separates Ohio State from the rest of the Big Ten is really the depth of talent they have on that team. And so for me right now, it's Ohio State's conference, you know, conference to lose. But Wisconsin is going to be tough. I think Minnesota also could be tough coming out of the other side. And then we saw Indiana give Ohio State a real strong run. Michael Penix is back. Ty Freifogel is back. Both, you know, Penix went for 500 yards. Freifogel went for 303 touchdowns. So they're two – Achilles Hills last year are back for Indiana in that division. That's going to be a huge game to watch. But Ohio State absolutely should be the favorite. Yeah, that's not surprising because, again, like it's similar. Not It's a little better than the ACC, but, yeah, it's pretty much Ohio State's conference to lose, similar to the ACC with Clemson. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the SEC. We've talked about the ACC. We've talked about the Big Ten. And pretty much we already talked about you know the Big 12 with Oklahoma being the big favorite. But what about the Pac-12? Because that seems like it's always wide open. It's probably going to can be wide open this year, but who are really the two or three teams that could be that could win the conference? Oh man, you know, you say it, you know, everyone keeps saying it's wide open, but for me, I feel like there's been the team that dominates. I mean, Oregon is looking to win their third straight Pac 12 mm-hmm. title, and they have just been leaps and bounds better than everybody else. And last year, they won it kind of by default, uh, to be honest. Washington qualified for the Pac 12 title got kicked out because of COVID, their arch rival gets to go in in Oregon and they upset USC for the Pac-12 title. So uh, just imagine how Washington feels right now. But you remember Oregon won it last year, man, with Panay Sewell, a top 10 draft pick, opting out, with Jeff Hall- with, with Javon Holland opting out, who was a top, I, I believe, 35 pick. They had like six players opt out who are going to be future NFL draft picks. So Oregon was struck really hard by COVID and still found a way to pull pull it out. Mario Cristobal for me, for so I get it. I'm from Alabama. I live in Kansas now. Southern fans who, you know, make up a, a lot of college football and a lot of strong voices of college football just ignore the Pac-12, which really aggravates me on our show. And, like, that's why we cover a lot of Pac-12 because they just forget that it's out there. It comes on it you know, 11 o'clock on on the East Coast. No one stays up to watch it. I understand. But Oregon's a real contender this year, in my opinion, for the college football playoff with how that roster's built. Mario Kristenball has done an excellent job. And in case you guys don't know who that is, he comes from the Nick Saban coaching tree and was the offensive line coach when Alabama was running through the early 2010s. So he knows how to build an SEC team, and that's what he's done. He started up by building the offensive line and moving outwards, and that defense is legit. I mean, right now they have the number one defensive line in the Pac-12, the number two secondary, and the number one linebacking core. And when you look at Kayvon Thibodeau, who, you know, outside of Derek Stingley at Clemson, might be the best defensive player in the entire country – On top of that, you have two five-star linebackers who were top 10 players in their class, manning the two linebacker spots. And then on the back end of the defense, Bennett Williams is a promising young talent. Michael Wright steps in at at the DB1 spot. Jamal Hill steps in on the other side. And Verone McKinley III is the next great safety, in my opinion, to come out of Oregon. So personally, 
I honestly, I honestly love what Oregon has on the defensive side of the ball. The only question I have about Oregon this year, man, is Anthony Brown at quarterback. I have a lot of questions. We did a whole show in terms of fall camp rumors this week where we, you know, we're going through talking about the latest quarterback battles, things like that. Anthony Brown's a transfer from Boston College. He has over 20 games of experience. But when he was at Boston College, he wasn't great. I mean, his true passing grade, I think, was like a 65, according to Pro Football Focus. He struggled with turnovers a lot. And he, he, in, in this most recent practice, he was one for six in the third down, um, I guess, segment of the practice and had trouble with his accuracy. And the, why this matters to me is because they have a five-star behind him. The kid's name is Todd Thompson. He's the highest-rated Oregon quarterback commit, you know, since Marcus Mariota, and he's a higher-rated player than Mariota was. He threw for almost 11,000 yards in, in his high school at Arizona, over 100 touchdowns. The kid's legit. He's already like 6'5", 220. He looks every bit the part to be the next great quarterback but they're not giving him a chance at the starting position. And I'm very worried that Anthony Brown's going to limit the potential of this Oregon team. Because if you just, if you blind, if you take a blind resume and blank out the quarterback, that roster is a national championship roster, in my opinion. But Anthony Brown is not a national championship quarterback. And that's where I worry about Oregon. And then of course, USC is going to challenge Keaton Slovis is the real deal, but they lost a lot in the transfer portal. The D lines there, but what's that secondary going to be like? And then I would watch out for Washington too. That was a team that slid into the back end of that AP top 25. We saw release last week. They were at 20. They have a five star quarterback waiting in the wings as well. And so I'm very concerned about how that's going to work out. Jimmy Lake taking over for Chris Peterson is very, very difficult. Always replacing a legend is hard. Washington's defense is going to be one of the elites of the country, but it's a question mark about how far can that offense take them. So there's a lot of question marks around Pac-12 contenders, but like you said, I think there's, I think it's Washington, USC, Oregon are the realistic contenders for that conference. Yeah, that makes sense. And I didn't really know all that about Oregon, but that is interesting to know. And yeah, Oregon, of course, won last year because of, you know, the whole thing with Washington. And then, of course, USC. I wasn't super impressed with USC last year. And of course, there was only, what, seven games? Or I think yeah. it was seven games, right? It was a really short season um, for the Pac 12. I, I think it was six, was actually. It? I think they were five and one after and going into the Pac 12 title game. They, I think they played five games. That's, and it just, the Pac 12 commissioner, Larry Scott, he's fired. You know, he, oh, he yeah. resigned mm-hmm. now. He never should have been able to keep his job, man. He butchered last season for the Pac-12 and really cost a lot of great athletes a chance at a national title. Yeah, and yeah, you know, just the whole West, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I think the Pac-12 is always forgotten, at least in the football terms. But it just gets at one time in the mid-2000s, the Pac-12 was the conference or was one of the conferences that people talked about. But, you mm-hmm. know, we'll see what happens within the next few years. I know they have a new um, – a new commissioner and maybe with the merger with the ACC and big 10, it's going to help a lot more. Um, And one quick thing that I saw from yesterday, I think it was reported on Wednesday, but the whole Scott Frost situation in Nebraska, it seems like they're kind of in trouble here. And of course, if Nebraska doesn't make the a bowl game this year, Scott Frost could be out. But what do you think Mm -hmm. about the whole Nebraska situation? I mean, it looks really bad. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, piss off the entire Cornhusker nation here, but I mean, it's a really bad look that you were cheating and still losing. (laughs) I mean, because there's reports, you know, they were using assistants inappropriately. They had too many because a lot of these COVID restrictions limited the staffs and things like that. So for me, it's a real bad look. One, it's a lack of, you know, team control for Scott Frost on top of not winning on top of now Scott Frost might be suspended for like four to six games I've heard, or, you know, they might, they're going to hand them a suspension for what I hear. And then also too, you might get a bowl ban, which, you know, you haven't really made bowl games recently. So I guess that is a big deal, you know, to some fans, but for me, Scott Frost is finding himself on the hottest seat in the country. And right now I feel like the patience is running very thin with the fans which means it's also probably running very thin with the upper management. And so Scott Frost right now is probably regretting every single day his decision to lose, uh, leave UCF from where they were. 
Yeah. It, well, it made sense at first because Scott Frost, everybody loved him there. And, of course, he goes to Nebraska a lot bigger, more money and stuff like that, a bigger school or at least – a bigger, you know, football school or whatever, even though UCF is becoming really good at football. But it was kind of – that was kind of the place, and then he just hasn't done enough or doesn't really – hasn't done anything. And, yeah, now he's got a $20 million buyout. So if if Nebraska can figure out a way to fire him with cause, I think they want to pay him that $20 million, yeah. but that's still a lot if you want to get rid of him in the whole situation. So, again, do, did you have anything else you wanted to add or – Oh yeah, uh, just one more thing. I mean, his biggest his so he's kind of in the same spot with me as Harbaugh. Oh yeah, his the biggest black mark on his resume is that he came in as an offensive guy who was able to recruit quarterbacks and has yet to recruit a good quarterback mm-hmm. in Nebraska. Yeah, how how are you landing the Blake Bortles, the McKenzie Miltons, the you know the the quality of quarterbacks that we've seen come out of UCF in the recent years? How are you getting them at UCF, but the best you could do at Nebraska is Adrian Martinez? Yeah. And then you get Luke McCaffrey, who now is playing at Northern Illinois, uh, Northern Iowa, I believe now, is now who landed Luke McCaffrey. So what in the world are you doing on the recruiting trail? And it's the same thing for Harbaugh up at Michigan, where you come in, you're like, I did this with Kaepernick. I did this with Alex Smith. I did this with Andrew Luck. And now the best you're giving me is Cade McNamara. <laughs> I just I can't accept it at you know when you're getting paid the amount of money that those two guys are. So I think Scott Frost the the biggest the biggest I guess criticism I have is how in the world can you not recruit a quarterback to Nebraska who honestly is a blue blood of college football based on like what they were doing in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of fans still think that at times it's kind of like um, Nebraska fans. I feel like are kind of like cowboy fans in the 90s where they think they're all this and really they're not and it's somewhat similar to michigan fans but i mean at least they have their basketball to cheer for so anyways um and now as we end the interview then again thanks for coming on do you have anything in store for the future for your podcast oh man you know just just check us out man we uh you know we got some awesome players lined up for after the season and during the season man we got some cool stuff coming down the pipeline man we're doing all kind of game content and live shows afterwards and a live game preview. And we're hosting like talk rooms on a halftime app on Sundays. So you can just join and vent about your team. And so no matter, and if you just want to get exposed to more football, because you, because I know it's hard to get invested when you don't know the players, the teams, just tune into our show, man. We cover, like I said, we cover every level of college football. So if you're looking for a team to get invested, man, we have player interviews. We have team breakdown so you can you know learn about a new team and have more football to watch like i say there's never too much football man so make sure to check us out if you just want some more college football content okay thanks again and again that is the blue bloods podcast hosted by zach mckinnell again all the information will be down in the description below all right thanks again for coming on zach and have a wonderful night